Yeah, absolutely. Well, Naomi, I appreciate your patience, and now we're much smoother. I can see you. It's great. Right on. Where right are on, you? Man. I'm in the back studio at the Buzz. We have this like back dungeon kind of studio. Um, I kind of like it. It's a little quieter back here. But we have like two studios. Looks very professional. <laughs> well, thanks, man. It's the soundproof walls. It gives the illusion of that. But, dude, I appreciate you coming on, man. But what I was asking you was uh, the Stand Up and Be Strong EP is amazing. And when it came out, you probably don't remember this, but my old band was out doing some shows with you guys around that time. And uh, we, so whenever I heard those recordings, it took me back to those days. But uh, the thing about it is like the, the songs that were recorded at First Avenue in 2005, that was the first show at First Avenue after Carl's passing, I would assume. And what is it like to hear those songs all these years later? Yeah, right. Um, well, uh, it's kind of because somebody showed me a little bit of it, and I was like, well, who, what's going on here? You know, who's then I see Tommy, and I'm like, oh, that's Tommy, huh? And that kind of gives me some context. Usually, when I see stuff from the past whether it's a photo or whatever, I see what kind of t-shirt I have on. And I'm like, I remember that t-shirt. What <laughs> happened to that t-shirt kind of thing? <laughs> so there's little, you know, I'm like, oh, it's Tommy. So that puts a time reference to it. Um, you know, I mean, post Carl's departure from this mortal coil, you know, things were, uh, it was a lot of uh, reacclimating to, just not having him there, you know, um, and the record, he was on his last legs when we recorded that record. And of course, nobody thought that he was actually going to die. Um, so I, I'm glad I have those memories of recording the record. Uh, so if it reminds me of anything, it probably reminds me of him, you know? Yeah. Absolutely, man. And they're great. It's great to hear him. And you have a, and I, it was Michael Bland playing drums at that time too, because he's been with you guys for quite a few years now. Yeah. 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 And Michael are solid. Super solid. And he's such a beast of a drummer. And I love that he doesn't even, I remember playing festivals with you guys like in Dallas and like the South in the middle of the summertime. And I'd be sweating like crazy on the drums. And I don't think I ever saw him really break a sweat. It was kind of otherworldly going on with that guy. He is definitely otherworldly. I mean, he's got perfect pitch. He's got so many musical faculties that you wouldn't expect from a typical drummer. And he can be in the middle of a song and, and say, but bass player, F sharp, not F. And he'll yell it loud enough so you can hear it over his drums. Um, and just kind of certain kind of intuitions about how you know things fit together where i guess i played drums in a band called the ogs and uh i love playing the drums and i had one of those one of those fake rolling sort of kits so I yeah we kind of talk to people while we were playing so it's like here comes the change one two three four <laughs> and stuff like that so that is something that michael is very adept at and he makes the set lists and he tries to get the right flow and the right keys and the right and all that kind of stuff that I'm just like, ah, I would throw a set list together and not think about it the same way that he does. Like it's got to vary in tempo and from one, the key of one song going into the next key and all that stuff. He's very, Intuitive, intuitive is, is the word that comes to mind, but just an incredibly musical person. And yeah. of course, my ally and partner in crime, if you will. Yeah. Is that, how is that nowadays, Torn versus the old lineup? Because I know you're the original member of the band now, the one original guy left. How is it different versus how it was back in the day? Is it more with, it seems like Michael kind of probably helps kind of steer the ship in a certain way. He is the rudder. Um, he gets the back room of the bus and, uh, it's hard to, it's hard to figure out which, cause you know, we started out like any band, we toured in a, in a van for 12 years 
and uh, that was certainly a different experience. And then by the time we moved to a, a bus, we were, you know, selling a lot of records and, and playing bigger venues and more and more people became involved and the next thing the next thing you know you're bringing your own monitor man and you're bringing your own light guy and you got another truck full of stuff because you have the opportunity to try to get it exactly how you want it to um in retrospect it's kind of like well how much how many stage props do we need you know we got a back drop and this, that, and the other thing, and a lighting guy, and this, that, and the other thing. And those are extraneous things, really, when you're you're just going out to play music. But uh, it's nice to have all that control and all those people. Um, there was some point where I was like, who's that guy? And <laughs> it's like, oh, that's the guy that's been driving the truck for the last month. And I'm like, hey, it's nice to meet you, man. <laughs> so... It got pretty large as far as a, a, a touring sort of a group of people. And uh, to be honest, I like it a little more stealth where we're really, we're moving as a, as a unit. There's only like seven or eight of us. And uh, it's just not as convoluted and confusing and, there's just less mouths to feed. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> less pressure on you. I could see that for sure, man. Dude, last night they had a they had a show at the Basement East uh, here in Nashville, Tennessee. It's a venue over on the east side of town, and it was called Grunge Night. And I went to check out the bands, and uh, they played a solo album song. They played Misery, and I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts when that song is lumped in to the grunge movement of time? What's your thought of that? Well, it doesn't really <clears throat> sound like what I would call typical grunge music. Yeah. Uh, and that whole thing was kind of, they didn't have that expression, you know, when we started out. There, there was no, no words such as alternative or, or grunge or whatever. So we kept getting lumped into these kind of bands that, record companies don't know what to do with so we were always kind of outsiders no matter where we went and uh i think i that it's i think it's fair to say that the grunge expression is somewhat of a seattle phenomenon i don't know if that's an accurate statement but you know the bands that i was playing and touring with where, you know, who's going to do and the replacements and stuff. And I don't know how much that sounds like grunge to anybody. Basically, I'm still pretty confused about what grunge actually is. I think it yeah. has something to do with tuning down the guitar. I think that's a big part of it. And I think that metal kind of got into the picture and it turned into this, <clears throat> this animal that yeah. is, people playing really low tuned guitars and it's a heavy sound. I mean, I like it. We tune yeah. some stuff, but not a lot of stuff, you know? Yeah. When I feel like nowadays too, uh, it seems like a lot of times the younger kids today, when they put together events like that, they kind of just assume anybody from the nineties because they also played a tonic song. And I was like, okay, now we're really getting far away from, from the grunge movement where you're throwing in tonic songs. But uh, I think that's the idea. They just do 90 songs, I assume. But yeah. it was uh, it was funny, though, to hear it. And they killed it. It sounded great. It's really interesting to think about how many of those bands are... I mean, I'm just going to say it. How many people in those bands are dead? And yeah. That, you know, as sad as that is, the Lane Staley's and the Chris Cornell's and the endless amount of people who are no longer with us uh sort of you know they are missed and it does make sense that if you're you know if you're a 22 year old kid and you want to be in a 50s band you're gonna play whatever you like but you're gonna assume that it was all sort of happening at the same time and you could be 10 years off one yeah. or the other or whatever kind of 
music you're attracted to more often than not i would say it's it's not as easy to categorize as uh, the average listener might like to just to make it convenient yeah uh, so you know you get lumped in with uh whatever it is is it first it's punk rock then it's college music then it's alternative and then it's something else and i don't even know what it is anymore but i like to think that it's just Soul Asylum music. <laughs> Absolutely. There should be a Soul Asylum tribute next time at the Basement East. That'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, I hope they did a good job on Misery. Oh, yeah. No, that's I, I great. It's great when, when I get to hear other people do my music. And, you know, having Prince cover one of my songs is, is a really interesting kind of paradox. I don't even know if that's the right word for it, but it certainly impresses my friends. <laughs> and, uh, it's really cool to hear someone like that put his stamp on my song it's yeah cool. he kind of turned it into like something that sounds like a prince song and yeah that's that's interesting uh, absolutely so yeah I, i'm a i'm a you know i lived in new orleans for 20 years and it's all about interpretation you can go out and see 20 bands uh, and they might all play My Funny Valentine, but they'll all play it differently. They might all yeah. play Sunny Side of the Street, and they'll all play it differently. They'll play standards, but they'll put their own interpretation on it. And uh, I enjoy that quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. I read somewhere that you moved to New Orleans, uh, quote unquote, to fall in love with music again. And did that happen to you when you were down there? I think I saw an article about that a while back. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's fair to say. I think that I had gotten kind of a, uh, what's the word, frustrated with the whole spectacularism of the rock and roll biz. And it seemed like it was a lot of, I don't know, sensationalizing or, or something. Words that I can't even explain. But I started losing track of what it was that I was really trying to learn about everything and of course I mean especially during the grunge quote unquote period everything did kind of start to sound the same I mean it just did there was a success formula out there and you had a whole bunch of bands that sounded like Pearl Jam or Nirvana and it just kind of I grew up as a trumpet player and I wanted to sort of find this music that I was hearing as a kid and sort of in a way it's it the, the bebop and the, and the jazz and the bebop and that sort of thing seems like it is more traditional in a way but to me it's more progressive so it, it, just to hear all these bands using chords that nobody in rock and roll uses and instruments yeah. that nobody in rock and roll uses it really refreshed my whole approach and uh i you know immersed myself in it and uh just was blown away by the great players in new orleans and that they, they would use some of them i was just surprised they would even play with me yeah and sometimes i was keeping up and trying to you know learn things which is what yeah. it's all about to me. I mean, you just keep learning and that keeps it interesting. If you're just phoning it in, I'd, I'd rather not see your band. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely, man. And for what it's worth to, I feel like, and I'm just saying this because I'm, I'm talking to you via the Zoom, but I've always felt that Candy from a Stranger got a really, really like, bad deal. It was a really good record. And I felt like the song, The Game, was one of my favorite Soul Asylum songs. Okay. I feel like that one was way up there and it could have really had you know, an appeal. I guess maybe people just assumed it would sound a certain way, but I think The Game was a very good song. I was a big fan of that tune. Yeah, that was recorded pretty much live in the studio. We were taking different approaches to different songs. And at one point, uh, I was like, well, it'd be cool to have a female voice on this song. And, you know, we still had a budget. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, well, who do you want? And I went, how about Stevie Nicks? And they <laughs> called her up. <laughs> so stuff like that was still kind of happening. Like, I mean, 
it didn't work yeah. out for whatever reason, but uh, we all sat in a circle and we all had acoustic guitars and we recorded, I think that whole song is recorded live. And that's what uh, I think people like about the uh, record, uh, the horse they rode in on. It's yeah. got a live feel to it. Um, but thank you. There's, there are people that will bring that song up to me and I'm like, oh, great. So we bring it back in the set every now and then. And yeah. We'll will again. Absolutely, man. Talking to Dave Pern on the local buzz. One more question I got to ask you, man. I do a thing on my show sometimes. Uh, it's kind of the idea of like true rock and roll stories. And I have a question for you. I've seen stuff online about it. So it might be like a mythical story. So if it is, I don't want to blow it for you. But I do have to ask, uh, back in 1995, you guys played on Letterman and you played Misery. And at the very end of Misery, there's a YouTube video where you pull out a trumpet and you start playing the trumpet part to Silly Love Songs by Wings. And Paul Schaefer comes out yeah. and takes it from you. Is that real or is that fake? It seems staged, but kind of real at the same time. It's, uh, well, let's put it this way. I put Paul Schaefer up to it. I said, I'm going to okay. play out the trumpet. And the second I start playing it, I want you to come up and take the trumpet away. But we never <laughs> told Letterman. So oh, wow. It was kind of like, oh, huh. So you guys are, I think he said hijinks, huh? <laughs> you like the hijinks, do you? So, That's yeah, amazing. Funny. I mean, it, you know. Yeah, well, it's become an urban legend thing because of stuff I found online about it. It's people saying that because of like Beatles royalties and things like that, like you single handedly made Letterman have to pay a million dollars and Paul Schaefer was mad. And there's all this stuff online about it. And I was like, I have to ask him if I ever get him back on the show. So I'm glad that you I'm cleared it up. I've never heard any of that. And the only thing I did see on Letterman was that they wanted to use an Eagles song. And uh, it cost too much money. And Letterman made a big deal about it. And that was interesting just to see him talking about it. But as far as I know, there was no repercussions from that. And we did play on the show again after that. Yeah. I don't need, I mean, I don't know how many people would notice where that horn part is from, but as far as I know. <laughs> You know, Paul McCartney. Yeah. I shouldn't. I shouldn't talk about it, but <laughs> I got about three notes into it, so I don't think there's like a legal situation going on. <laughs> well, it's funny how it fits in there so well because whenever we were out playing shows with you guys, you would sing that part at the end, and I remember thinking, "Oh wow, it does fit really well inside that song. That's awesome." Yeah, it's uh, pretty much the same three chords. <laughs> I love it. The Back in Your Face tour kicks off in August. You guys are going to be here in Murfreesboro, Tennessee at the Hop Springs Beer Park, September 4th. And I think it's rad you're bringing Local H back and Juliana Hatfield. Love both yeah. those bands. That's going to be awesome. You go back with both those artists, too, so that'll be a good tour. Yeah, I've known Juliana since way back in the day. Not well, just in passing. And uh, Local H was on the tour that got canceled, so we kind of figured we'd just continue on with them and yes we did become fast friends they're great guys with a great sense of humor and they're very low maintenance because there's only two of them and yeah you know, thank god they have a sense of humor <laughs> it's so true well dave it's always an honor having you on the show man i appreciate you taking the time to do it now i'm stoked to see you guys play i was at the last show i'll definitely be at this one too it's always Fun to see you in the boys rock. Maybe I'll drag Phil Solom out too. If he wants to leave, he hasn't left his house yet, but I'll try to get him to. Oh, it'd be great to see Phil. He's <laughs> Yeah. It's been a minute, but man, but I appreciate you very much, my man. You have a good rest of your night. Phil. I met Phil's mom. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Dude, that was wild, man. She would go out. She was like 90 years old, I think. Yeah. And I went out and I picked her and him up at a Broadway bar at 2 a.m. And she was down to go for one more drink. I was like, wow. She I get the Solom thing. Her man she's yeah there. yeah she really was <laughs> well dude it's great talking to you my man you have a good rest of your night and i'll get this all edited up and I'll, I'll tag you guys in it and stuff is it okay to use some of the video footage too or i can just use the audio it's up to you i mean it's fine with me okay right on man cool You'll <laughs> find out. my lawyers will come calling. <laughs> i knew it <laughs> no, you got you got this as me giving you permission so right on man well i appreciate it dude i'll send the link to janine and everything but i appreciate you man thanks man have a great night right. yeah man see you soon all right